Welcome to more course on introduction to proteogenomics. Our next speaker is Dr. Kerstin Krug who will talk about effect of mutations on signaling pathways and how they could be studied using softwares like MIMP and active driver BD. He will talk about the frequency of phosphorylation and factors which may lead to specific kinase activity. He will also talk about tools like Motif X and Phosphocyte Plus for sequence motif analysis and also calculate the frequency of most recurring amino acids near the site of phosphorylation. So, let us now welcome Dr. Kerstin Krug to talk in more detail about the role of various mutations on signaling pathways and also to tell us about various factors which may help us in understanding how phosphorylation can be understood in a biological system. So, I will, I will first uh, going to give you like a short motivation. So, what is why we want to do that and then I will be very specific and I will talk about two specific software tools that try to uh, you know that try to uh, study the impact of mutations on phosphorylation networks. So, as Bing just presented, so there's millions of single nucleotide variants known in the human genome and many of them are associated with uh, certain human diseases, but for most of them we do not know the exact uh, molecular mechanism that uh, you know, causes this genotype to phenotype association. And as we've learned yesterday uh, in, in, during Kelly's and, and David's talk and also during the hands-on, so mutations can, if they are located in protein and protein regions, they can be non-synonymous, meaning they can lead to a single amino acid substitution, so they can change an amino acid uh, in the protein sequence. And here, so, I mean, there's many different synonyms for this uh, event, so non-synonymous SMV is single amino acid variant or single amino acid variant, so these are all uh, you know, refer to the same kind of event, but you will find all of, all of these in, in, in the literature. And of course, many of these single nucleotide uh, or non-synonymous single nucleotide variants, they affect sites or amino acids that can be post-translationally modified, like phosphorylation, acetylation, or ubiquitination. And actually, these modifiable amino acids occur very frequently in the human genome. So, what you're looking at here are the frequencies of all 20 uh, amino acids in the human proteome. So, the most frequent amino acid is, that occurs is leucine, but then on, on the second uh, place, we already find serine, which can be phosphorylated, right? And what, is hi what are highlighted here are serines, lysines, uh, theonines, and tyrosines. So, lysines are, uh, or, you know, can, can be modified by acetylation or ubiquitination. So, these are the most well studied and, uh, you know, so we have the technology to study these modifications on a large scale. So, that's why I highlighted, them, highlighted those amino acids here. And if you just uh, look at the, the uh, like, you know, the, the overall frequencies of these four amino acids, they make up for 22 percent of all amino acids that occur in the human proteome. So, it's very likely that a mutation affects these modification sites. And we are asking the question, what kind of consequences does that imply in downstream signaling events? And there has been many studies uh, out there that try to, you know, decipher these kind of uh, relationships, and I'm just highlighting a couple of those here. Um, so, you know, the, the most basic kind of approach to to take here is to look at kinase sequence recognition motifs. So, kinase phosphorylates its substrate and one mechanism uh, to ensure that the kinase, you know, specifically identifies its substrate is, uh, you know, is uh, given by very local interactions, so meaning it's, a, it's the amino acid sequence, the properties of the amino acid sequence around the phosphorylation site. So basically, as probably many of you have seen these kinds of uh, sequence logo motifs here, where in the center you, you're looking at the actual modification site. So this aurora kinase B uh, mostly phosphorylates serines, but also uh, theonines. And if you look at the, the, the frequency around 
it substrates, you know, flanking the sequence, you see that there's a strong enrichment of an arginine at position minus two, regard, uh, you know, relative to the phosphorylation site. So this is, this, uh, this is what we call the uh, uh, sequence recognition motif of overall kinase B. So basically, it recognizes the arginine at minus two. Any questions to that? Well, um, I mean, Aurora kinase, I mean, there's two classes of kinases. So one a separate class is tyrosine kinases, which only is specifically phosphorylated tyrosines. If you look at all known substrate of Aurora kinase, we find most of them have, a, I mean, most sites are serine sites, and then there's a smaller fraction of theonine sites. So Aurora kinase cannot phosphorylate tyrosines. Well, um, yes. so we are looking so we this. We have arginine also. So, like, why we have taken that as a zero position? So, the zero position is actually the site where the phosphorylation happens, okay. right? And we are looking around I this phosphorylation left and right. Okay. So, and there's, again, there's many tools that can generate these kind of logos and perform these enrichment tools. And uh, you know, the, 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 the common principle of these tools is you test for enrichment of amino acid patterns that surround this phosphorylation site. And you compare it against some background data set. So uh, for example, you have your phosphorylation site data set that, that you've acquired in your lab. Um, you, know, you have like, in this case, maybe like 20 sites or so. So these can be all, of your, all detected sites in your experiment. Or if you, let's say, you specifically inhibited the kinase and now you're looking for uh, all phosphorylation sites that are downregulated upon in inhibition. So this could tell you these are very likely substrates, either direct or indirect, of this particular kinase. And then you compare, so you compare the frequencies that you obtained here against the background data set. And this can, again, be all detected phosphocytes in your data set, or you could use all known phosphorylation sites in your human proteome, for example. So as I mentioned, there's several tools. So two very popular ones uh, is, uh, are MotiveX and the sequence motive analysis tool on phosphocyte plus. So MotiveX was probably one of the first, if not the first tool, which was uh, published back in 2005 by, by Steve Gigi's lab at uh, Harvard Medical School. And so the, the basic principle again, so you have your phosphorylation sites. So the center is where the phosphorylation happened. And then we're looking at uh, the surrounding amino acids. And from that, you can very easily build up this kind of frequency matrix where in the columns, you have your offset positions. Again, in the, in the like zero means these are my this is the actual phosphorylation side, and then you're looking at seven amino acids to the left and seven amino acids to the right in this case. Again, this is very arbitrary, so some tools use different you know, sequence windows length and so on. And on the y-axis, you're looking at the, like all 20 amino acids. And then you just basically count the frequencies of uh, these amino acids in your data. For example, in this case, we would have uh, like three glycines, um, exactly, we would have two prolines and, and so on and so forth, right? So it's very easy to, to build up this kind of frequency matrix. And uh, this is exactly what mode of X does, so it builds up these two matrices. One is derived from your actual phosphocytes of interest, and the other matrix is derived from your background data set, and from that you can then calculate a binomial matrix, a binomial probability matrix, where you, for each position in your sequence window, you ask, and for each uh, amino acid, you ask the question, for example, in this case, uh, how many times do you observe a proline at position plus one in your data set? This you can calculate for each amino acid and each um, position. And you compare it against the background frequency which you derive from your background data set. 
which can again be the, the entire human proteome or, your, or all of your detected sites. And from that you can then calculate or uh, generate the sequence windows. Yeah, I just put up an, an example which is based on the seven sequence windows that, that, uh, that we've looked at a couple of slides earlier. So if you actually calculate this probability to observe K out of N, so N in this case was seven, so we looked at seven sequence windows, we observed four prolines at position plus one, uh, you know, and the background probability of a proline in the human proteome is roughly 0.062. And, you know, in R, you can just feed it into, into uh, the, the binome test function and you get a p-value that this indeed, although it's a very small sample size, uh, it would be statistically significant. So four out of seven, so on and so forth. This, again, you would do for all amino acids in all locations. So um, probably don't have to go too much into detail here. So Motive X does it like in, a, in an iterative manner. So it, it uh, first of all takes all sites that you feed in uh, and, and extracts the most significant uh, sequence motifs from that set and then it removes those from the initial set and repeats the analysis. So that's one uh, you know, specific property of the software. Okay, so now we know how we can look or how we can determine these specific kind of sequence recognition motifs, but now what happens if, these, uh, if a mutation happens in this kind of region around the phosphorylation site? So there's actually three different scenarios that can happen. So one is a direct hit. So you actually, so this is the wild type here. This is the mutated version. So in the wild type, you have a serine which is actually phosphorylated. And uh, this serine now, due to a, a mutation, gets mutated into a histidine. So it cannot be phosphorylated anymore. And of course, this can also happen the other way around, right? So the histidine can be mutated into a serine, which now maybe present a new phosphorylation site, which can be recognized by kinase. So it can be either, like, it can lead to a genesis of a phosphorylation site or to a destruction of phosphorylation site. So the other possibility that could happen, uh, so it does not happen at the exact site, but it can happen very close to the phosphorylation site. So in this case, we have this proline here at plus one, uh, which now is mutated into arginine, and the kinase that was able to recognize this proline can now not phosphorylate this, this, spe uh, this specific serine anymore because the, the proline is gone, right? So, meaning in this case, we would lose this phosphorylation site. Again, it can also go the other way around. Uh, or it can also happen that you just uh, change the uh, sequence kinase motif. So in this case, in the wild type, it was kinase A who recognized uh, this motif, and now due to, due to a, a mutation, this motif changed into another motif that is, can be recognized by kinase B. So these are the most simplest examples of these kinds of events that we are looking at. Um, there's also like further, or like events that happen uh, you know, further apart from the phosphorylation site, for example, if a mutation hits a kinase domain, um, which contains the catalytic function of this kinase, it can also change the, uh, it can lead to, uh, to um, aberrant kinase activity. So here on this slide, I just presented a couple of tools. So there's many tools out there already. And, uh, you know, people have started looking into that uh, 10 years back already. Uh, but also recently there are lots of uh, new developments. So one, so these are actually the two tools we are, we are going to have a closer look at. So one tool is called MIMP and the other is called uh, Active DriverDB. Just want to highlight, so this other tool here, G2P database, so genome to phospho database, which uh, has been developed in David Fenio's lab as well. So uh, in Yeah. But uh, there it was asking which uh, site is uh, phosphorylated. Like in the peptide, might be that the serine position is the uh, fourth position. Yes. Um, but uh, uh, in my sequence, it was serine 32. So I was not able to use the uh, motive 
complex because I am a biologist, I am not a programmer. Yes. So is any one of these tools, as you know all of these tools, is any one of these tools solved by problem? No, well, these tools don't solve your problem. There are, so this is one step actually upstream of this type of analysis. So many of these tools that actually take the raw mass spectrometry data and do the database search and create result reports on a phosphocyte level, let's say. So many of these tools already have these kind of sequence windows in their result table. So this is actually not a peptide sequence, right? It's the sequence window which is always the same length. So in this case, it's always 15 amino acids. It's this, the, 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 and, this, and the modification site is in the center. So this is something that many tools create, like MaxQuant does it, like SpectrMill does it. I'm not sure whether uh, uh, Proteome Discoverer does it no, as well. No, in Proteome Discoverer, I got uh, peptide sequence. And yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I see your problem. So what you would have to do, you need to hire a programmer that just takes the data, takes the database and creates the sequence windows. So, or you just use another software. So I can highly recommend MaxQuant. Okay, so MIMP does exactly what we've just talked about. So um, it predicts the impact of uh, non-synonymous SMBs on kinase substrate interactions. So it predicts um, kinase binding affinities and how or whether mutation rewires protein or like phosphorus signaling networks. And it compares, so that's basically like the, the principle here. So it compares the effect of mutated and wild type samples. And uh, one uh, you know, specific property of this tool is that it uses a Bayesian approach to construct like these uh, in this case, position weight matrices, which is probably, which is very similar to these amino acid frequency matrix, matrix that we just looked at. So this has been published in Nature Method uh, in, in like three years back, and there's an online tool which you can just use, but there's also like an R implementation of that package, and this is actually what we are trying to use in the hands-on session, so I hope that, that we will be able to do that, so we'll see. So the key features is it first uh, builds kinase binding models using known substrate sites. So very highly curated, very well known phosphorylation sites that have been determined to be a substrate of this particular kinase. It used this information to build binding models. And these models are already included in the software. Right? So this is nothing that you have to worry about. So then calculates for a given phosphor sequence that might be now coming from your data set, it calculates the kinase binding score. For each kinase, it calculates the score, how likely it is that this phosphocyte has been phosphorylated by this specific, uh, by this specific um, kinase. And again, so you can upload your own phosphor sequences or you can just uh, query all phosphocyte sequences in phosphocyte plus. Does everybody know about this, this resource here, phosphocyte plus? So I can, again, highly recommend to, to check that out. So at the end of my slides, there are uh, like all references that I'm going through here are included. So you can just go to the papers and, and check them out. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the first part is calculating kinase binding uh, specificities and then it uh, pulls in mutation data, which again, you can upload your own mutations or, it take, or you can specifically look for TCGA mutations. And then it does its uh, prediction. So today, in conclusion, I hope you have learned that kinase activity gets affected due to the amino acids which are present in the surrounding of the phosphorylation site. Hence, if we know the correlation of amino acid to phosphorylation specificity, then we may change the expression pattern of a gene. We also heard that Motif X follows an iterative workflow which provides us reliable and confident amino acid sequence which could result for the phosphorylation regulation. Mutations can lead to genesis, modification or destruction of P sites 
resulting in altered pathways. Dr. Krug also enlisted many tools which can be used for correlation between genomic mutations and signaling pathways. The next lecture will be the continuation of mutation and signaling by Dr. Kerstin Krug. Thank you.